All right, y'all will need Bibles. You'll need a study guide as well. Study guides are on that back table. Uh, you guys will need Bibles. Bibles are in the rack over there. You guys doing all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So listen, listen, I don't want to get you too fired up and too excited because I'm already there, all right? A couple of things you need to know. This upcoming Sunday evening will be the last Sunday night Bible study for uh, our Sunday night study. We're not going to have a Bible study this Sunday night. Instead, this Sunday night, what we're going to do is we're going to come up here and we're going to have a Thanksgiving feast, all right? And we'll feast, 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 all right? Uh, uh, we will have adults up here with us. We will probably not play. We're probably just going to hang out and enjoy everybody. This so good. Uh, but, but on the... Saturday after, on the Saturday after Thanksgiving, the 28th, we will be going to, uh, we'll be going to the home of Joey and Janet Brittner. We'll be having a bonfire out there, roasting hot dogs, enjoying s'mores, having a hayride, and we will probably be playing, in fact, I can almost guarantee you we'll be playing Murder in the Dark out there. All right. And listen, it gets kind of creepy out there. It can get creepy out there at night when it gets dark. It's on Saturday, the 28th. It's the Saturday after Thanksgiving. It's at Joey and Janet Brittner's house. They're, they live in Springville. Uh, so we'll be heading out that way. I'm looking forward to that. I hope you are as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Now, I don't want to hear, I know that everyone's excited right now, but I don't want to hear tears as we crank this last statement out there. But yes, yes, this is the last study in the book of Nehemiah for us. So I said I didn't want that. I didn't want that. None of that. No rejoicing, no mourning. We just take it for what it is. We will not meet next Wednesday because next Wednesday is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. And so we will not meet next Wednesday, but when we come back together, the following Wednesday, we're going to jump into our Christmas series, and we're going to be looking at uh, the gifts of the Magi. Does anybody know what the Magi brought Jesus? Brought to him three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We're going to be looking at those. They didn't just, listen, so they didn't just, um, <laughs> they didn't just go, hey, what, what, can we take, what can we take Jesus? Hey, you see some frankincense over there? Yeah, why don't we just take that? It wasn't like that kind of thing. They actually brought it for a reason. It was a very intentional thing that they brought those gifts. So we'll start breaking into that once we return, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that. We'll jump into that series, and I love looking into it. Just so you know, this is my favorite time of year, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I love it. Love Thanksgiving and Christmas. Enjoy it a whole lot. And today's lesson from Nehemiah got me so fired up. Because when we look at Nehemiah today, we're going to be seeing that Nehemiah is a type of Christ. Do you guys know what I mean when I say that he is a type of Christ? Do you guys know what that means? I see, okay, so I saw this, I saw, I saw, yes. So, I'm going to take that as one of those gestures, whether it was the audible one or the physical one, was a lie. So let me explain to you what a type of Christ is. When we talk about Christ, Christ is the archetype, all right? He is the archetype. He is the first he is the original. He is the archetype. A type is something that, not completely, but in some way, form, or fashion, it shows us the archetype. It points us to the archetype. Nehemiah is a type of Christ. So what does that mean? That means that Nehemiah points us to 
Christ. It points us to Jesus. And I mean like the actual man, Nehemiah. We can see him pointing us to Jesus. In the story of Nehemiah and who he is and what he's done, we can see the story of Jesus and who he is and what he's done. Now, a lot of you might sit there and think, how? He went and built a wall, and I don't remember Jesus ever building walls in the gospel. No, Jesus did not build a wall. So how is he a type of Christ? Well, we're going to get there. But just to remind you, as we've walked through Nehemiah in these last few weeks, we've done so seeing it through the lens of the solas. Grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. And tonight, the last one we're looking at is that Christ alone. And so we're going to, yeah, like the song, in Christ alone. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to dive into the book of Nehemiah and we're going to see Christ alone. But let me make this statement clear. The reason why it's a sola, the reason why it's one of the five is because it is essential. It is important. It is absolutely necessary that you believe and you know and you trust in Christ alone. I mean, all by himself, nothing standing beside him, nothing in front of him, nothing behind him. It's Christ alone. If you're trusting in Christ, you guys, by the way, when I say Christ, you know who I'm talking about, right? Who am I talking about? Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the Savior, If you are trusting in Christ and your family, then you're not trusting in Christ. If you are trusting in Christ and coming to this church, then you're not trusting in Christ alone. If you are trusting in Christ and that I've really been a nice person, then you're not trusting in Christ alone. It is absolutely essential that you know this, that if you have not trusted in Christ alone, then you haven't trusted in Christ at all. It's like this. Let me, let me put it to you this way. When it comes to talking about God, when it comes to talking about Christ, we're talking about, if you think of it in multiplication terms, okay? So when you talk about God, you're talking about three in one. So you're talking about one times one times one. And what does that equal? One. It always will equal one. That's okay. One day you'll get there. We're not talking about one plus one plus one. We're talking about one times one times one. And we have to understand this too. When it comes to belief when it comes to our trust when it comes to our salvation when it comes to being saved from sin and death we have to understand that christ is the one he is the only and what we bring to the table is a great big fat zero now if you trust or if you make a multiplication table of one times zero what do you get zero and if you've trusted in Christ and your own good works, that's one times zero. You've zeroed it out. If you trust in Christ and coming to church, that's one times zero. You've zeroed it out. If you trust in Christ and family or Christ and friends or Christ and good works or anything else, you've done it one times zero and you've bottomed it out. You guys see how that works? So, the first question in our study guide asks this, why must Christ alone be held as an essential Christian belief? And I've kind of already explained it to you in like a mathematical term. And I've already explained it to you in a way that maybe we can wrap our minds around it, but it hasn't really told you what he did and what only he could do. 
So I'm going to throw out some big terms to you. I'm going to throw out some big words to you. And we're going to walk through them and I'm going to explain them as we go along. Okay? So why must Christ alone be held as an essential Christian belief? Well, the answer is this. Christ alone, no one else, but Christ alone can give us righteousness, regeneration, and redemption. Christ alone can give us righteousness, regeneration, and redemption. Now, y'all probably heard at least a couple of those words. Y'all probably heard righteousness, probably heard redemption before. Is there anyone who has not heard the word regeneration before? It's okay if you haven't. Okay. (laughs) Regeneration is a big term. I will explain it here in a little bit. But before we jump into diving into terms... I want to read to you Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. And let me kind of set this up for you. Nehemiah had come. He had, well, before he even came, you remember he threw himself upon the grace of God. He realized that things had to be done. A work had to be finished. A wall had to be built around Jerusalem. So he threw himself upon the grace of God and he prayed to God on behalf of Israel. The king, when Nehemiah, when Nehemiah was before him, the king allowed Nehemiah to come to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And while he was here, he poured into working for Jerusalem, like he was doing work for God himself. He got everyone else to pour into the wall like they were working for God himself. Along the way, he encountered a lot of difficulty. I mean, and I didn't really get us in the drugs of that because we're going to see a lot of it today, okay? But he encountered a lot of difficulty. People wanted to come up there. They wanted to kill Nehemiah. People wanted to invade, uh, invade Jerusalem before the walls were finished because they knew if they waited until after the walls were finished, they weren't going to be able to get in there. But Nehemiah, in record time, in 52 days, had that wall finished, all the gates restored. And then he looked around. He saw all the work that he had done, been done. And he knew that his time was up to work there. He put people in charge, and he had to go back to the king. Remember, he was the king's cupbearer. Do you guys remember that? He had to go back to the king. So, in Nehemiah 13, this is after Nehemiah has left. And let's read Nehemiah 13, 1 through 9, if you want to follow along with it, it's also on your study guide. Let me read it for us. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now let me explain what's going on there. It's a story from uh, another place in the Bible. Uh, Balaam was a false prophet who was hired to pronounce a curse, but God wouldn't let him curse him. It's a really cool story. Let me finish up. Now before this, Eliashib the priest who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah. Tobiah was a bad dude. Tobiah was one of the guys who was against Nehemiah from the get-go. Related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering and the frankincense, the vessels and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers and gatekeepers and the 
contributions for the priests. And while this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. This is, this is Nehemiah talking. I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem and then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done, before, done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers. And I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. Let me pray for us, and we're going to jump in. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do love you. We do praise you. God, I thank you for this word, and I thank you for Nehemiah, and I thank you for uh, him being a type that points us to Christ, to our archetype. God, I pray that as we look at these verses, we would see the stand that Nehemiah makes. We would see the enemies that he overthrows. We would see the service that he did for Jerusalem. And God, it would be clear as a bell how we can see your son clearly taught through this book. I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, and for his sake. Amen. All right. So Christ alone is an essential belief because only Christ alone <clears throat> can redeem, can regenerate. Only Christ alone can restore. Only He can do those things. Now, in this book of Nehemiah, in this 13 chapter book, we've read a lot about what Nehemiah did. Was there anybody else for the job other than Nehemiah? Well, I would argue no. No one else was there for the job. No one else had the understanding. No one else could be there with the king. No one else could get the king's blessing. No one else could get letters from the king. No one else had the position where they could talk to the king. Nobody else could have done in this story of Nehemiah what he did. There was a job to be done and only one person can do it. Only one man had the qualifications for it. It was Nehemiah. Now, what was the job that was to be done? It was to build a wall around Jerusalem. That was the job to be done. And we sit there and think, well, that sounds like a lot of people could have done that. Not true. Not true at all. There was only one who could have the opportunity to do it, and it was Nehemiah. And so when Nehemiah came, he came to do a job that only he could do. He came to complete a task that only he could do. He came to fulfill something that nobody else was qualified to do. And so what I want us to see here is the walls, or rather the task, the building of the walls... That right there, that's number two on there. The walls point us to righteousness. Remember how I said that only Christ, Christ alone, could bring us righteousness. The walls point us to the righteousness. It's, it's a type that shows us to the righteousness that Christ brings. What do I mean by that? Why do I put walls and righteousness in the same, in the same breath? And when I mean righteousness, I mean being morally upright. What does it mean to be morally upright? Good morals? What does it mean to have good morals? Your priorities, yeah, what you think, what you believe. It's not just like, okay, if I believe, if, I, if my moral says don't kill anybody, but then I walk in and I shoot somebody, then are my morals, my morals might be, 
might be in the right place, but my standard of applying those morals are wrong. Would you agree with that? So to be morally upright is to have the correct understanding, the right priorities, the right morals, but to be upright in them. Not only to have correct morals, but to stand in them. Does that make sense? So when we talk about the walls, I want you to see that it points us to the righteousness that Christ offers. His being morally upright. What do I mean by that? Yeah. How the walls are upright? Yes, yeah, so there's a very, uh, a very physical understanding of the walls where they were straight, they were upright, they were secure, right? Because of the walls... Everyone in Jerusalem could be covered if they were inside the walls. So there is that. But why am I saying that it's righteousness? Why am I saying that that's the term? Well, let let me break this down for you, okay? How many of us here are righteous on our own? How many of us here are morally upright on our own? Everybody here knows it's wrong to tell a lie, right? Everybody here knows it's wrong to tell a lie. Is there anybody in who sits there and thinks, nah, lying's good, lying is great, lying is wonderful, and lying is my thing? (laughs) Nobody in here really believes that. But how many of you in here have told a lie? Yeah. So we might have a right moral, but are we morally upright? No. I can walk down... A list of thousands. All of us in here know that it's right to obey our parents, right? Everybody in here knows it's right to obey your parents. That your parents have been put in a position of authority over you, and you obey them. You might not always like it, but you obey them. We all know that. How many of us have ever disobeyed our parents? Uh, Not you. Wait a second, wait a second, she said, she said, not me, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think that would be a breaking of the last thing we talked about. What was the last thing we talked about? Oh yeah, lying, oh that's right, that's right. Who? Who? We all understand morals, but none of us are morally upright. None of us are righteous. That's a problem because if we're going to be with God for forever, if we want to go to heaven, we have to be righteous. We have to be morally upright. In fact, we can't just be kind of righteous. We have to be all in 100% righteous and none of us are that. So let's go to the scripture. How does Christ And how does Nehemiah building up walls show us Christ building up righteousness for us? So someone go to Luke 22, 39 through, I see your hand first, Casey, 39 through 44. And someone take Matthew 3, Logan, I got yours, Logan, uh, you go to Matthew 3, 13 through 17. All right? All right? Yeah? All right. Now, I could, spend, I could have spent the whole time on the comparison here. I, I love this. How do we see Nehemiah as a type to Christ? And I, I, I loved this when I came across. I did. This one was an aha moment for me. Do you know what, you know what I mean when I say an aha moment? Like, yeah, it was a light bulb that went off. I had never seen this before. And I, I mean, this, was, this is blowing my mind. It's been blowing my mind all through this study. So Luke 22... 39 through 44, read that for us whenever you get there, Casey.
So guys, here's what's going on there. Jesus prays here in the garden. This is right before Jesus is about to be crucified. This is right before he's about to do the work that he came to do. This is right before he's going to save people from their sins. And this is what he says as he kneels down, as he prays. He says, Lord, if it's your will, let this what be taken from me? Let, let this cup be taken from me. Let this cup be taken. What is the cup? The cup is, it's called the bitter cup. It's the cup of death, death on a cross. The cup of sacrificing himself for the sins of mankind. If it's your will, take this cup from me. And, and as I looked into this, I thought, oh my word. It blows my mind, that wording right there. Take this cup from me. And Nehemiah was the what to the king? He was the cup bearer to the king. What was the job of the cup bearer? That he was to make sure what was given to the king was good, was not poisoned, was right. Jesus is willing to offer, and if you go to the high priestly prayer in John... He is willing to offer His children to God as, 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 as His. He's going to give us to Him. He's going to say, here are, here are my followers, God. But to offer it to the King, to offer it to God, before that, He has to drink the bitter cup. He has to drink a cup that will cause Him to die, to remove our sins. Nehemiah has a position before the king, the cupbearer. And in order to be able to raise up that wall, in order to be able to secure the people of Jerusalem, he has to take that cup before the king and he has to be seen by him. And he has to be willing to take the cup. He has to be willing to... I love that illustration. The idea that Nehemiah was the cupbearer and Jesus drank the cup of bitterness. But why did he do it? It wasn't just to take away our sins, but Christ also on the cross fulfilled our righteousness. Read for us Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. God looked at Jesus. He looked at who he was. And I want you to see, Jesus showed up to John and John says, I don't need to baptize you. You should baptize me. Why is that? Because this was a baptism of repentance. This was a baptism saying, I've done wrong and I need to be washed clean. I need to repent of those things. I need to be made righteous. And Jesus comes up there and Jesus walks up to John and John says, no, 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 no. you don't need to be baptized I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, permit it now to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus came to fulfill the righteousness that you and I don't have. He came to do a job that only he could do. He came to be morally upright because we cannot be. And this righteous son of God... Because of his sacrifice on the cross, because he's taken away the sins of those who would trust in him, and not only has he given us, or not only has he taken away our sins, he gives us his righteousness. So the Bible says we are clothed in righteousness. We are encompassed in righteousness, just like Jerusalem was encompassed by a wall. Only one man could do the job of building the wall. It was Nehemiah. Only one person could come up there and clothe us in a righteousness. And it was Jesus. Only he could do it. Only he could drink that bitter cup. Only he could be the cup bearer to the king of God. 
Only He could be that righteous, morally upright one to build up for us a covering. Does that make sense? The next one is this. We talked about how Ezra read the law to them and the people worshipped God at the reading of the law. I want to say this. The reading of the law points to regeneration. And regeneration is a big word that just means new life, okay? It means being born again, or it means being raised to life that we never have had before. And so we're going to open up to some passages of Scripture. How is it that the reading of the law points to that? Well, remember what, remember what the reading of law did. When they read the law, their spirits, their the, the hearts and the souls of the people who heard it, remember what they did? They worshipped. They fell down and they worshipped God. At the reading of the word, at the reading of the law, their lives were focused. Their lives were given new meaning. Their lives were directed in a way they had not been since they had been in exile. And so I want us to read a few passages. Someone get Romans 3.23, and then someone get John 3, 1 through 3. Who wants Romans 3.23? Who wants that one? Who wants, come on, guys. Who wants Romans 3? Go for it, Kayla. Who wants John 3, 1 through 3? I see your hand, Amelia. And uh, you take that one. All right? Romans 3.23. Whenever you get there, go ahead and uh, read for us, Miss Kayla. So when we see it's regeneration, and what that means is new life, okay? But why do we need new life? What's wrong with the one that we have? Go for it whenever you're ready, Kayla. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No surprise there. We just walked, about, walked through the idea that we're not morally upright. We have sinned against God. All of us have sinned against God. And therefore, Ephesians 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Because of our sin, because of your sin, because of my sin, we are dead. Our souls are sin dead. What can a dead thing do? Nothing. It can stink. That's the best it can offer. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what do we need? What do we need? We need our, our lives refocused. We need our minds renewed. We need our lives restored. We need regeneration. We need new life. And Jesus says to a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Go ahead and read it when you get there. Or if you're there already. So what he says there, Nicodemus looks at him and says, we know you're from God, Jesus. We know that God sent you, Jesus. We know because of all the things you've done. We know that only you can do these things because only you have been sent from God in this way. And Jesus says, unless you are born again, unless you have new life, unless you are regenerate, can you enter the kingdom of God? What does that mean? That means your sin-dead soul, your sin-dead self is removed from you, is crucified with Christ. The righteousness of Christ gives you new life. It awakens your eyes, it awakens your mind, it awakens your heart to understanding and knowing that everything else I've done in life has been wrong. I need my mind to be focused on the one thing it needs to be. And when Ezra read the law in Nehemiah, it immediately had that effect. They recognized, we don't need the old life we've had. We need the life that God provides. 
and he provides new life. He provides regeneration in none other than Christ Jesus. And lastly, the driving out of the enemies. What we just read in Nehemiah 13, where he went up there and he saw uh, <clears throat> when he, about the Ammonites and the Moabites, and he sees Tobiah in the, uh, in the temple. He drives out that enemy, and when we see him drive out the enemies, it points us to redemption, being bought back. And here's what I mean by that. When we see him drive out the enemies, when we see, and, it, and there's some, it says that he goes in there, he sees Tobiah's furniture in there, and it says he throws it out, and it says he gets rid of it, and he brings back in the things that belonged in the temple. You guys remember how I read that, how I threw that junk out, a garbage out. The enemy of God was living in there. He throws his stuff out and he brings in the things that were of God and puts them back in the temple. That reminds me a lot of the story where Christ goes into the temple and where he, where he sees all the money changers and he tips over their tables. But not only that, his driving out the enemies points us to redemption of being bought back. Let's look to the scriptures real quick and let's see also how this points to Christ. We've got 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Go for it whenever you uh, get there. And Romans 6, 15 through 18. You've got it, Amelia? Romans 6, you got it? You got Romans 6, 15 through 18? All right. Let's see how we've been bought back. How him driving out his enemies shows us that we've been bought back. Go for it. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You are the temple of God. If you are the temple of God, then what Christ comes and does is he doesn't, he doesn't just take away your sins, give you his righteousness, and let you keep living in sin. No, what Jesus does is he drives out the enemies. He scatters them from you. He removes your desire to be with them. He takes those things out of your life, out of your heart. He drives them away, kicks them out, and he redeems you. He buys you back for himself. You were created for Christ, and because he dies on a cross, takes away your sins, gives you his righteousness, he buys you back for him. Because you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you needed new life, he gives it to you, he buys you back, he drives out that old you. He gets rid of it. He crucifies it, he puts it to death, and now you're no longer a slave to that old way you lived, you're no longer a slave to that old way, to that old pattern. You're no longer shackled to that. Rather, you have something else. You have a new master. And Romans 6, 15 through 18 explains it. We're bought back. We're redeemed. That old way of life, those old habits, they've been removed. They've been driven out. They have no place any longer. And the great and the true reality, and, and Paul doesn't shy away with it. When we hear slavery, we sit there and we think, what an awful and an evil thing. And yes, that is true. Slavery, as we have seen it in human terms, has never been right. It has never been good. But when we see slave to sin, it's even worse. It's even more terrible. It's even more depraved and wicked. Sin to human beings is bad. Sin or a slave to human is bad. Slave to sin is evil and the worst thing we could possibly imagine. And Jesus comes in and he drives out our enemy. He overthrows our captive and he sets us free. And here's what he sets us free to. He sets us free to be slaves to obedience to Christ. 
Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that we just have another cruel slave master? No, it means we are slaves to the one who has gone and he's been our righteousness. He has been our new life. He has been the one who has bought us back at the cost of his own life. We are now slaves under a man who has done everything for us. And he says, now walk and live with me. I've clothed you in righteousness. I've given you new life and centered your focus. I've driven out your enemies before you. You can now live with me. But here's the thing, guys. It's not automatic. I sit here and I tell you these things, and I'm telling you the truth that all those things are realities in Christ and Christ alone. Can you have righteousness? Can you have regeneration? Can you have redemption? But understand this. You don't start out that way. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. And if you have not trusted in Christ, then you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. And in this room, there very likely is students, men, women, who are still dead in your trespasses and sins. And you have not trusted in Christ. You have not been bought back your enemies have not been driven out from among you I talk to a lot of you and a lot of you I, I, won't, I won't say you I've spoken with a, a young man recently who grew up in church and I asked him are you a believer and he said yes he didn't even bat an eye yes I'm a, I'm a believer I'm a Christian absolutely I'm a Christian and I said tell me why you believe that I mean, I, I've always just, I've always been just a good person. I've always just believed. That was his honest to goodness answer. And when I sat down, I said, but it's, it's about Christ. It's about Christ alone. Only Christ can give you a new life. Only He can redeem you. Only He can restore you. Only he can provide your righteousness. It's not about you being a good person. It's about Christ being a good person on your behalf. This is a person who's grown up in church all his life, and he believes that when he dies, he's going to be going to heaven. But understand this, he hasn't trusted in Christ alone. He's trusted in Christ times zero, his efforts. And he's bottomed it out. And my fear is that many, many, many in the church and maybe even some sitting in this room right now are in that same boat. I can't see your heart. I can't look into your souls and know. But I can know that everyone in here, if I were to ask you one-on-one, -on -one, are you a Christian? Everyone in here would probably say yes. And then if I asked you to explain to me how you know, my great fear is that you'd be like that young man and say, well, and you point to Jesus, one, and then you times it something else. Christ alone is the answer for every man, woman, and child. And if you've got Christ in anything else or no Christ at all, you are not saved. What I implore you to do now is to consider those questions if Christ is so essential and if it's Christ alone that's so essential have I trusted in Christ alone and if you're not even sure you don't have to say no I haven't done that but if, you, if you're not even sure if, you, if you've got like a question mark about it I, I don't want you to leave here without talking to me or Drew or Pastor Tim or somebody we love you too much to let you just stay in that boat without us challenging you. Let me pray for us. And the band where Drew Pendus is going to come up and it's going to lead in some songs. Most gracious Holy Father, we do love you and we do praise you. And I thank you for um, your word. And I thank you for Nehemiah and how he points us to Christ. I pray that we would now sing to Christ and worship that we would sing to him and it with, with, our, with our very all and that even our worship in this time would be pointed towards you. And all of these things I pray in your son's name, Jesus, and for his sake. Amen.